Hello YouTube, in this video I'm going to be discussing the different styles of deadlift and how to decide which one is best suited for you. Uh, this is actually the third installment I've made on deadlifts and the other ones spoke about the programming tactics surrounding the lift and the methods and technique you should apply for bodybuilding purposes. So today I'm not going to mention these two topics. If you want to learn more, they're in the description of the video. This is more going to concern the comparison of stars and the differences in muscle activation and in progression you're going to get from selecting one or the other because in reality there are many stars of deadlifts. You are not going to be limited by just the conventional. You have a plethora of options that could actually be best suited for you and the way you're built. But before you decide on which one to select, there is certain things you need to hear and that you need to be aware of because there's a lot of myths surrounding that very topic. Exercise selection in general is the realm of biomechanics guru and they like to overcomplicate stuff. Today I want to present something simple and logical that is going to help you across the board to deadlift more often, more aggressively and throughout the years because I firmly believe that the deadlift, aka a hip hinge from the floor, a pull from the floor, is an absolutely necessary part of any bodybuilder's program. So, as I say that, we are not going to be using EMG data to decipher between the stars. One, because I'm no scientist. Two, I don't have a machine to plug on myself to see which muscle is activated or not. And three, because across the years, every single time I've seen one of these studies, especially applied to the deadlift, I was disappointed. Not disappointed in the capacities of the machine, disappointed in the interpretation that the person who ran the study actually came up with. A lot of the time, there is a large amount of misinterpretation of data. And this is something that is, in my opinion, dishonest and misguiding for people who are going to take it at face value. The best example I can give of this is a few years ago. I read a study by a person whose name I'm not going to cite which compared the different muscle activation between deadlift style. And they placed the deadlift styles on a spectrum. And then they, they put points down, commas, that they separated from one another with a certain distance. And they said, okay, this is how much difference there is in muscle activation in terms of lower back and posterior chain. And they surmised based on this, that the amount of difference was minimal and therefore did not exist. And our conclusion was that the level of muscular activation in, for example, the conventional and the sumo was the exact same because the difference was minimal. And to me, the second I saw that, the second I thought, okay, you did not understand the results of your own study. This difference that you're showing on the graph might be minimal on paper, but one, you did not specify the value that separates those two points. Two, it's only during one set of the exercise, meaning that this distance over time compounds. And I can tell you for a fact that this is going to be true across the board. Regardless of the style you pick, you will make muscular progress. There's no such thing as a deadlift style that doesn't grow your muscles. But regarding, of, regarding and depending on the style you pick, there is going to be a difference in terms of muscular development. If you pick style A or style B and you train for three years in separate universes, you're going to have a completely different body at the end. I can guarantee you that. And therefore, it's important to use logic, not EMG data, just straight up reasoning abilities that you can only get through experience that once you have experience, you can apply to the world around you. So that's what I'm going to be using today. Experience in logic beats scientific and meta studies every single time, or at least that's what I've found. And I also want to make clear that this is me giving you pointers and advice. But after that, it is your job to go on the field and apply it. Basically, do science the way it's supposed to be done. You have an hypothesis, you go out and you test it yourself. Because the way it applies to one person might not apply to you. And therefore, if I today describe a certain style that looks suited to you, before you jump the gun and you decide that I just changed your life, go out and test it. When you test a lift, you start low, low volume, low intensity, low weight, and you slowly peak. This way, you're going to be able to actually assess by yourself and for yourself if this is suitable for you. 
Now that it's been established, let's start immediately. The stars I'm going to be mentioning today are going to be conventional sumo and trap bar. These are the ones I have the most experience with because I actually trained them. I make a clear distinction between lifts I have trained with my body and the ones I have no actual experience with. And therefore, these three I include as me having some expertise on because I trained all of them for at least eight months intensely. For the conventional four years, the trap bar a year and a half, sumo was eight months. As for the Jefferson and the hack deadlift, I have never done these lifts in my life. So I'm going to give my opinion, which is not going to constitute solid evidence because I like the experience, but I'm going to use biomechanics, reasoning, and logics to explain the way they grow the body. First and foremost, we're going to talk about the conventional, the most common style of deadlift. Most people who deadlift, deadlift conventional for a reason. One, it's culturally accepted, it's the norm. Two, it's what is also elected as the king of hip hinges and pulls for bodybuilding purposes if you want to grow your posterior chain and upper back. And I agree with that assessment, but I'm going to balance it a bit because, and unlike what a lot of people are going to tell you, the conventional deadlift is not for everyone. A lot of people do not have the proportions to pull conventional, at least for maximum effort. I believe that everyone, every human on earth, has the ability to pick up something that is in front of them. This is encoded in our DNAs. But when you start talking about maximum intensity, when the structure is put under a lot of stress, this is the moment where you want to be smart. You want to pull in the most efficient position. You don't want to force your body into a position that is not mechanically advantageous. That's how you get injured. And a lot of guys, especially tall men, or men who tend to have leverages that put them at parallel with the floor before they pull, which is also very common in women, tend to have difficulties with the conventional because they recruit too much lower back as they pull. And of course, this also means and shows that the conventional out of all of the deadlift styles, no uh, exception, is the style that requires the most lumb uh, lower back. The lumbar spine is going to be the most solicited and the musculature of the area as well. There is no comparison with the other styles. And this also means that because you bend over so much and the rigidity of the lumbar spine is required, you're also going to recruit more posterior chain. And across the board, all of this is regardless of weight because the position you put yourself in as you deadlift is uncomfortable, yes. But it's also disadvantages for everyone. Even with the people who have good leverages for the conventional deadlift, there are stars that would put you at, a, at an advantage in terms of actual mechanical leverages. You choose to pull conventional because you get away with it, there's no pain, and you put the muscles under more stress. Across the board, if you compare, me, uh, if you compare leverages, uh, the mechanical structure of the body, and the muscular structure of the body, aka the muscle bellies, you will find that styles that are going to require a large amount of mechanical tension are also going to be the ones who are going to require the more muscular activation. Because if you, if you remove the ability of the body to use the best possible lines to move the weight through gravity, you're forcing the muscles to be used more. Uh, that's pretty much essential to understand for exercise selection. And so, as you enter the conventional, you are willingly making that choice. You're telling yourself, I'm doing the most difficult style because I want the muscles to be challenged the most. This is also the reason why a lot of people are elitist with the conventional is because they rightfully believe it's the toughest style. But it's not a reason to put down the other styles. If it's something that you actually can get away with, I recommend you pull conventional. It is not dangerous for those who are suited for the lift. For the others, I actually still recommend you do conventional, but as variations only with sub-maximal loads for higher reps. Don't let yourself be caught up in repping three rep max on the conventional deadlift if it's not suitable for you. Instead, do Romanian deadlifts. Still a conventional deadlift, but a mo much more manageable one with a much lower risk of injury because you can control the range of motion and focus on the negative. You could do stiff leg deadlifts. Finally, your parallel back is not a problem anymore because now it's with less load. These are valid options. And as I said also, the conventional is the king of hypertrophy and you're going to have to treat it as such. 
meaning that compared to the other stars, it is the one that you're going to want to do the least amount of. You're going to want to bank on intensity and a lower frequency on this one and also a lower volume. A lot of people say that the deadlift has a bad stimulus to fatigue ratio, fatigue to stimulus. This is not necessarily true in the sense that a lot of people who use that don't really understand the concept of stimulus to fatigue because uh, the very issue of that concept is that any stimulus results in fatigue. So in reality, these are the same concepts. What they mean by that is that the amount of fatigue that you get put through as you do conventional deadlift might lead to an overreach in terms of the recuperation capacities of the body, which means that you're putting too much work in for not enough benefits. And that I would agree. It's like pouring water in a jug. If the water overflows, you still poured the water. It's not in the jug anymore, but it's not in the glass either. It just spilled. That's a good example of going overboard on the conventional deadlift. You want to pour enough so that you fill the glass, but not enough that it overflows. And I would even argue that it's always better to undershoot it a bit with that type of exercise. This is what it means to actually balance the stimulus to fatigue ratio. And to end up with a little caution, cautionary tale of sort for the conventional deadlift, the reason why it's not suited for a lot of people is because it has very high extensions demands, meaning that you're going to need a very rigid thoracic spine and lumbar spine to be able to pull it off. If you don't and you round the spine, that's not the end of the wood. That being said, for deadlift's sake, in terms of bodybuilding, it's a posture chain exercise. So if you start doing what I call the fish rope, when your back is like this, when you deadlift, you're losing the plot because now most of the time your knees are going to be pre-locked and you're going to always end up locking with your back. And this is not conducive to hypertrophy in the long term for people who are going to rep deadlifts frequently for years and years. So I ask you to be very careful with that. Again, a lot of people, and as I said, the, the studies that I see in presented the stars as, as interchangeable, as if you could just do whichever one you wanted and get the same result. It's not true, but the problem of me telling you that is that you might going to become a little bit too obsessed with the conventional and you're going to think, I need to pull conventional because if I don't, I'm going to lose on those sweet, sweet gains. And I want to tell you that this is not true. Yes, there is a difference. If you take two guys and one does conventional and one does sumo for three years, the guy who does conventional will be bigger in terms of if it's the same individual cloned, he will have better gains in terms of uh, posterior chain in terms of lower back and I would even argue upper back because again of the torso angle check the video in the description to understand why but if those two individuals are now separate and one is injury prone on the deadlift guess what if we clone that individual that is injury prone and one does conventional and one does sumo even though the guy who does conventional is still applying the principles of the king of hypertrophy He's going to be smaller than the guy who does sumo. Why? Because he's going to get snapped up. And at the end of the day, doing the exercise frequently for a long time and progressing is more important than the quality of the exercise in itself. This is key to understand as we move on to the sumo deadlift that again, a lot of people rightfully present as opposite to the conventional. These are not the same lifts. I've heard people even say that the sumo is not technically a deadlift. It's more of a squat. They're not wrong. Okay, this doesn't mean that sumo is cheating for all the powerlifters out there who are going to make a fuss about it, but it does mean that it requires different set of qualities and that it's going to target different muscles. Not entirely because it's still a pull from the floor, but there are differences and denying them is dangerous for the aesthetic minded, those who lift to look better. The sumo is especially good for those who struggle to maintain a vertical torso as they deadlift. Because keep in mind, when you do conventional deadlift, you're bending over to grab the bar in front of you. So as you struggle against gravity, the weight is also trying to make you topple forward, which leads to the rounding of the back in individuals who struggle to make, maintain extension. With the sumo, you don't have that problem anymore. Why? The weight is closer to you. It's, it's almost inside, not quite, but almost. And what a lot of people don't get is they think the bar is in front of you, so it's the same thing. You need to look at where the bar sits compared to your hips. When you do conventional deadlift, if the bar is here, your hips are here. 
If you do sumo, the bar is here, your hips are here. So the bar is underneath your hips. This reduces the amount of pressure on the spine. You're not being pulled forward anymore, you're being pulled down. And it's the reason why a lot of people say that the sticking point of the sumo deadlift is off the floor. They are right. You don't get that in portion that you actually gather when you are uncalling yourself from a conventional deadlift. Now you have to create drive from the floor with minimal torso lean. This is really tough. But it also means that it has a lot of qualities. It can help you stay vertical throughout the pole, even at the bottom. And it also means that for a lot of people who have those problems, getting to the bar and getting in position for the conventional, it's going to be a life changer. Now, instead of having to bend forward, you just have to open up the hips and bend at the knee. Again, a lot of people don't realize it. The sumo deadlift has a lot of quad activation. Why? There's more knee flexion in the conventional. And if you just looked at visual cues, which again is not a good way to decide on the biomechanics of a lift, you would say, okay, that's just not true. There is as much, if not more, knee bend in the conventional. Just look at the angle. Well, you would be correct if and only if the stances were the same. It's exactly the, uh, the perfect example and the same thing for the squat. If you have a very narrow stance, you can go into a lot of knee flexion and still not help, not help, not hit parallel. Why? Because your feet are close together and therefore the knee has a lot of space to travel in forward. And the more you widen the stance and you point the feet out, the less you're going to visually look like you're traveling a lot, but the more you travel in a sense. Because now when you look at the leg, for the leg to go to parallel, there's much less distance to travel. This is not a mag magic trick. It just means that other areas of the body take the, the, the brunt of the, the damage or the pressure or the fatigue, whatever you want to call it, AKA the hips. It's the same for the deadlift. If you have your feet like this, yes, it looks like the knees are traveling forward a ton, but it's because they have the space in front of them to go this way. And because it's much more evident when the knees travel in a straight line, when you are have, when you have a wide stance on the sumo and you point the feet out, a tiny bit of knee flexion goes a long way because this time the knees, the knees travel outward. So it also means that since the bar is underneath you, it's a double whammy. It's much easier to grab the bar and then pull. And for anyone who's tall or who always struggled with the conventional, I tell you, give sumo a try. I have had many tall guys who told me that it changed their life. And you won't lose on gains, as I explained, because it is always better for you to pull from the floor than to just pull conventional once a month and get injured. Disregard the people, especially the shorter men, who tell you to just suck it up. They don't understand your plight, okay? Just do what is best for, best for your biomechanics. It's always better for you to pull sumo than to not pull at all. And you can complete that with variations of the conventional, as I said. For the people who struggle to fill their glutes on the pose, this is also a lifesaver because it's pretty much, you could replace the name sumo deadlift and call it a glute elevator because it's really what it is. If you deadlift, if you sumo deadlift properly, you're going to be very vertical. And what happens is you're trying to lock the knee and what propels you up is the glutes pushing you. And I've always found that for someone like me, for example, who has very big glutes to start with, the sumo is not a good thing to do. It's the reason why I dropped it in part because it was only glutes. Like it felt like a bracing exercise where I was just strengthening my core and then doing like glute presses up and down. It was really strange. I didn't really feel my armstrings or my lower back at all. The good news is that this is because I have good leverages, quote unquote, for the deadlift. I have safe leverages, not good, safe. For you who has unsafe leverages, the sumo deadlift will still put you in a position where you're bent forward to grab the bar. And therefore, you are still going to get a decent amount of activation on your lumbar spine and your arm strings. And therefore, the sumo deadlift for you looks more like an, an hybrid of a conventional and a sumo. And this is perfect because it fits your needs. This is actually the best way for you to pull. But you might be limited by your hip mobility and the structure of your hips. It's what I said about the squats too. If squatting with a wide stance is such a hack because you cut the range of motion, why doesn't everyone squat with that stance? One, not everyone is comfortable in terms of pure power output. Two, a lot of people will get injured, me included, because it is very demanding. 
So be careful. The good thing is that the sumo, just like the conventional in a relatively more relaxed way, is not a lift you want to do all the time. It's a lift that you want to actually spare, maybe do it once a week. And then do variations throughout the week of hip hinges to reinforce it. And you will progress just fine. So that's already the conversation between conventional and sumo, which no are not the same. Conventional is going to be more glutes, arm strings, lower back, upper back, with a tiny bit of an advantage for sumo to certain individuals. But the sumo is going to be like a, a more mechanically advantageous type of pull that is going to, by default, also allow you to let the structure breathe a bit more. And if that results in less muscular activation, so be it, as long as you do it often. I hope I was clear with that mechanical and muscular thing, uh, because I know that it can be a little bit uh, daunting for some people to hear these terms. It's very simple in a sense. When I talk about mechanics, I speak about the leverages regardless of the muscles attached to them. Think, as a, think of a crane. A crane is a leverage. It has muscle in the, the, the cables and the mechanisms that pull it, but the structure in itself is just purely mechanical. For the body, it's the same. If I strip your body down naked with no muscles, your segments are still there. The structure is still there. There are good or bad leverages dependent on the type of muscles you have or the amount of muscle mass you have. The type of lifts that are going to allow you to put the structure and reorganize, reorganize it in a fashion that allows for better leverages are going to also be the one that require the, the less amount of muscular tension and activation. You have to play with that. How much are you willing to sacrifice in terms of muscular activation to be safe, to be able to have longevity in your practice? This is a question you must ask yourself for every single lift. Because the next one is actually the most friendly in terms of structure and mechanical abuse to the body. And that is going to be the trap bar. I get a lot of questions about the trap bar. People are a bit freaked out and they ask me, okay, if I do trap bar, will I get gains? And the answer is, of course, yes, it's resistance training. It's a pull from the floor. You will get gains. Will you get the same gains as conventional? No. And the people who try to, to uh, spin that lie also, again should be more careful with what they say, because I think it's many people who want to make the deadlift accessible and they want to at the same time soothe the novices and therefore they tell them, oh, it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. You're not bent forward nearly as much. The torso angle is completely different. And therefore, the muscle activation is also completely different. Keep in mind that a lot of what dictates the muscle activation in the pool is the torso angle and the amount of knee flexion. To me, the trap bar is the most natural style. Not the most functional, the most natural, because if you're just standing there, your hands naturally fall aligned in a neutral position. And this is how you, you grab your groceries. When you carry your groceries home, you don't carry them with a supinated grip and you don't carry them with a pronated grip. You grab them by your side. Why? It's the way your shoulders fall. It's the way the arms is actually attached. And therefore, a trap bar is the perfect neutral grip. This is the most natural. In terms of the way you pull, it's also the most natural. I told you that the sumo was almost inside, almost. The trap bar is inside, meaning that the weight is perfectly midfoot. With the deadlift, I know a lot of people think, okay, I put the bar midfoot, so the weight is midfoot. The weight would be midfoot in terms of gravity if your hips weren't so far back. So no, the weight is not midfoot. The weight is actually in front of you. If you could see the forces that you're pulling, the deadlift would be a strong force in front of you. The sumo deadlift would be a mild force in front of you and up, and the trap bar would be straight up up, meaning that it's, it's underneath you. If I could, if I could attach chains to your body to represent it, the chains of a conventional deadlift would be angled like this, of a sumo deadlift that would be angled like this, and of the trap bar that would be angled like this. That's for the main style of the trap bar where you're just pulling straight up. And therefore, this is very safe, very natural. This is how you get up from a chair. It's a trap bar deadlift. It's, it's a mix of a squat and a trap bar deadlift where you're extending the knee. And it's something that is going to be accessible for anyone who wants to get started. And I think that it's, it's a good start for these type of people. I don't personally recommend just sticking to trap bar for people who are more advanced for a multitude of reasons. First one being that most trap bars I found were limited to 500 pounds. And even though that's already a lot of weight, 
The trouble is easier than the other stars. And this is when we get into the dick measuring contest of the deadlift stars, which makes the conversation impossible to have. Too many people have their egos invested in their deadlift star, and they fail to realize or recognize that some stars are just easier. Why? Because they have less mechanical demands and therefore they have less muscular demands. If you have a star that is more mechanically advantageous, there's this less uh, muscular demand and therefore it is much easier to pull more weight with the same body. And if I were to actually make a comparison, I would say that yes, the star that is the toughest to pull in is the deadlift, is the conventional followed by the squat, the sumo. But the, the, the kicker with these two stars and the thing that most people don't get in the powerlifting world is that we are all best suited for one or the other. Meaning that just because someone pulls 900 conventional does not mean they have the ability to pull a thousand sumo and vice versa. Actually, I have found that strong sumo pullers tend to have a much better carryover to their conventional than the opposite. Meaning that you need a certain disposition of the hip hinge, of the, the hip socket to be able to sumo appropriately, at least with maximal loads. And it's not really the same for conventional, if that makes sense. So these two are sort of all of the equation. It's an endless discussion. But in terms of, again, muscular demand, the conventional is above. There is no debate to have. The trap bar is easier than the sumo for sure. Meaning that I know that there's a, there's a bunch of uh, 900 conventional puller who can pull a thousand on the trap bar, no problem at all. And so you will find that 500 might actually be not that much weight. And once you are maxing out the bar, what do you do then? Do you have to switch to a different style? I like the trap bar as an introduction to pulls, especially for people who have been spending a lot of time in chairs and not being very mobile in their life. You find that it's less difficult, there's less demands on the lumbar spine, and it, it can actually reinforce the muscle of the posterior chain to the point that you can then move the trainee into a different style, like sumo conventional, with more ease of mind. And it's also a great tool in terms of progression because you can start the trainee with high handles, then make them move to low handles, then finally conventional because the high handles, if they are here, the low handles are here, the conventional is here for the most part. So it's always going to be a nice way to practically make the trainee go lower and lower because the lower you have to bend over to grab onto a bar, the more you have to actually physically bend over and therefore the more lumbar spine you're going to actually recruit, which can be difficult for some individuals. It also has more quad drive, just like the sumo deadlift, because you are more upright and there is more knee flexion. The more knee flexion you have to go through to enter the lift, the more knee, knee extension you need to get out of the lift and lock it. So this is also the case for this. And you might ask, okay, it makes sense for the sumo because your stance is so wide, but the stance for the trap bar is very similar to the conventional for a lot of people. Yes, but look at what the weight is. There is much more space when you do a trap bar deadlift for the knee to travel forward before you pull and therefore you can recruit a lot more quads. With the conventional, the bar is in front of you. And if you let your, your shins push the bar forward because you want maximum knee extension, you're going to have a very tough time pulling that bar because now you're letting go of that, that uncoiling factor I described that is so beneficial in the conventional to get the bar off of the floor, which also makes the conventional the one where the sticking point tends to be at the knee when you're about to lock the knee. There's also much less spinal load because of the way the weight sits. Uh, actual loading is a discussion to have, it's a really interesting topic. But for the pull, the way you have to think about it is this. Again, where is the weight pulling me? What is the, diff the direction in which I'm being pulled? That's why your spine is being pulled as well. And with the trap bar, it's pulling you down. So yes, there is still pressure on the spine, but it's a downward pressure instead of a diagonal pressure. So there's much less risk of injury. I just want to throw out there that there is still a potential to mess yourself up if you try to aggressively lock your hips at the top of the trap bar, because unlike the conventional where the weight is sitting in front of you and there's no risk, and the sumo is the same beast, with the trap bar, it's sitting underneath. So if you pull your hips in a weird position, you can actually hurt yourself because now there is no limiting factor for the hip to travel forward. There's no bar to stop you. You can overextend the hip. So uh, be 
be more reasonable and more responsible when it comes to that. The, the lock of a trap bar to start with is super natural because as I said, it's like standing up from a chair. So don't over exaggerate it. You will find also that a lot of people uh, have less difficulties in terms of, um, in terms of uh, not necessarily shoulder need, health and needs, but more of the position of the hands. A lot of people, when they have to pick the conventional and their hands are in front of you, it messes them up. When the neutral grip is much better. That being said, there are certain individuals like me who do not handle that well. For me, that neutral grip eventually tires my shoulders out. So you have to play with that. But I do believe that you will still get very good upper back gains from the trap bar deadlift. It's not going to be as good for the middle back because you're not as bent forward, but for the traps, it can still be excellent because at the end of the day, it's weighted stretch. And regardless of if your arm is like this or like this, the trap is still being stretched. Now, onto what I have less experience of, the Jefferson. The Jefferson, I would say, is if we rank the lifts in terms of difficulty in between potentially the trap bar and the sumo. I have heard people say that it's easier even than the trap bar. I am not certain about that. But what I do know is that since the bar is sitting right underneath you, it has the same qualities as the trap bar. A lot of quad involvement, less spinal loading or risk of lower back injury. And as I have also heard from a lot of people, it is more athletic. And the reason why is because the stance is not cookie cutter in a sense. It is true that a conventional for someone who's training for athleticism is a little bit sketchy and a little bit funky too because you are never in that position in a sport. You're never with your, with your feet like this. Usually you're, you like to be planted wider and you'd never bend forward in that fashion. I, don't, I cannot think of a single sport that functions like this. And the sumo is sort of the same thing unless you're an actual sumo wrestler and even they don't really train that lift at all. So if we're going to talk about applicability to everyday life, then yes, the Jefferson and the trap bar will most likely be the best. And in terms of muscle activation, you can expect the same from a Jefferson as from a trap bar or a, an easier version of the sumo. The hack is in the same category in a sense. It's even easier. I think the, the hack squat is the easiest form of deadlift. Why? Because this time the chain is pulling you behind. It's behind you. And therefore, you can literally use the weight of your own body to fight off against it. It's the reason why if you look at the weight uh, that is being actually pulled on the, the car deadlifts in strongman, they tend to lift ridiculous amounts of weight. Why? Because the weight is behind them. It's easier to lift. And therefore, you will find that you're much stronger on that lift. I've heard people say that it's minimal. That's not true. It's, it's a lot of weight. And uh, this also means that the requirements, again, on the muscular structure is lesser. Why? Because the, the leverages are very advantageous. And I say that also because I want to warn you against what I call and many have called the, uh, the warm, the warm, let's call it just the warm, the spaghetti spine that I've seen people do on the hack, on the hack deadlift that is questionable at best and dangerous at worst, where their spine does this as they try to get the weight up because they like, they contortionate themselves to try to get the weight up. Uh, don't do that. It is perfectly possible to do a, a hack deadlift with a perfectly neutral spine and just locking the legs. You don't have to do that. Most likely, if you have to go like this, it's because you're starting with the bar way too close to your Achilles tendon. Give it some room to breathe. If you have to go with a false grip and strap to be able to go behind you, so be it. But don't start so close. A lot of people complain, oh, my arm strings get in the way. Yeah, and I'm not. It's because you start with the bar way too close uh, from you. It would be the same in a, a normal deadlift. Imagine if you started a conventional deadlift with the bar already touching your shins. You would run into your quads if you have any. You would run into your balls. You don't. Why? Because you start with the bar mid-foot. Same logic here, start with the bar a little bit further. And the hack uh, deadlift can also be something that you can use to lower the amount of strain on the lower back. But as I said, I do not encourage people to use these as their main styles. If you feel a passion and a fire for them, go for it. But, like, but as I said, they put you in mechanically advantageous positions. And if your goal is to actually train the muscle and not just lift maximum amounts of weight, then you should actually go for another style, aka either the conventional 
or the sumo, because keep in mind that all of the variations and unorthodox types of deadlifts that come after that are just, again, as I said, biomechanical differences that are applied to main styles that already exist. And therefore, sticking to the main style might be the best thing. In terms of uh, dispositions of weights and depths that you can also apply to these two styles, there's blocks and there's deficits. This is really easy to go through and not uh, hard to understand at all. The block is going to put the, the bar higher. You have to go into less of a hip hinge to grab that bar. There is less demand on the lower back and therefore you can lift supra maximum weights that is going to tax the upper back more. So if you want a variation of the deadlift that is going to trigger trap and middle back growth more, do block pulls, do rack pulls. You also find, and this is a tip and a hack, for tall guys out there, that if you really have a love for conventional, but that you find that the problem is those few inches at the bottom where your spine just goes completely whack, try with blocks. You might find that you're now able to pull conventional with no problem and you get good growth from it. And for the deficit, it's the opposite. You go into more of a hip hinge, more of a knee flexion for many people, and therefore there's more demands on the posterior chain and lower back. And that can be also extremely good for people who struggle to use leg drive. I have always recommended for people who do conventional with a safe form, but we, who fail to use as much leg as they could to do conventional, uh, to do conventional deficit deadlifts with sub-maximal weights for 10 reps and try to engage as much leg drive as possible. You will find that this makes a massive difference. And the two can be perfectly used in any program. But for bodybuilding's sake, I do not encourage you to do uh, the sumo blocks, block pulls, or deficit sumos. Keep in mind that the sumo is the replacement style you use as your main strength work because the conventional just doesn't cut it. It doesn't mean that every single pull is in the line of specificity. You still do the rest of your pulls conventional style using weights that don't put you at risk. And that is going to wrap it up for all of these styles. This is all I have for you guys today. So just to sum it up, right, to make it deadly clear, for bodybuilding purposes, I, rec I, I recommend and encourage you to do conventional purse variations. The variations include, as I said, block, deficits, etc. If you're tall, you can do sumo plus conventional variations. If you're a beginner, you can do trap bar plus conventional variations to build yourself up to the day where you're going to go to conventional press variations. And for athletes, which I'm not an athlete, but for the people who want that functionality, you can do trap bar, Jefferson, or hack, whatever floats your boat. And I would even argue that if you're going to do that, might as well actually use a stance that is in line with your sport. Because it is true that there's been a lot of critiques about people who say, that just replicating a sport movement, a sport-specific movement, doesn't make an exercise sport-specific. And I highly agree with that mindset. That being said, specificity still applies to sports. And so if you have, a, like, for example, you're a lineman and you have a specific stance when you're a lineman, well, it wouldn't be too stupid to try and do pulls in that stance. You will run into issues, however, if you try to use supra maximal loads, do not do that. You're an athlete. You're not lifting weights just to lift weights. You're lifting weights to be better on the field. So lift less weight with better form with the stance that is the closest to carry over to the stance you want to be strong in as an athlete. And that's pretty much that for this video. I'm not shitting on the Jefferson and the hack and all of that. But I do believe that a lot of people are mistaken in the hypertrophy benefits they get from it because they don't realize how much easier these lifts are compared to the quote-unquote main style. And if we're talking about difficult lifts, I'm going to leave you with my favorite type of deadlift variation, the snatch grip deadlift. I'm planning a video on snatch grip uh, everything at some point because I love that grip. But if you're the type of person who does conventional and has been doing conventional for a while, and you would like to embrace a different style to do strength work in, but sumo just doesn't cut it, and you don't really want to do Jefferson or something else, and you want something that still applies to the conventional, do snatch grip deadlift. I have started them two years ago. I am deeply in love with them. They're amazing. 
they are more difficult than conventional, but since the weight is still in front of you, it carries over perfectly, not one-to-one, -one, but very close. And if you need form guidance for that, let me know in the comments. I can make a video on the snatch rook deadlift. It would be perfectly fine. I would ha be happy to do that. But absolutely give it a try. Start with, start with like two plates or as low, low weight as you can. Find the stance that you're going to like. Mine is very narrow. And just play with it. There's more knee flexion. There's more hip hinge. There's more lumbar flexion. It's everything. The stretch on the upper back is different. You will not regret embracing that. But before you do that, start to think about what your main star should be. And I believe that with the information of this video, it should be an easy task. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.